Welcome to the 19th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone, oh, there's nobody in the public gallery, but thank you. We have apologies this morning from Colin Beattie and Angela Constance, MSP, is attending in his, in his place. Item one is declaration of interest. I'd like to invite Angela Constance to declare any relevant interests. I have no int uh, relevant interests that are relevant to this committee. Thank you. Item two, decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take items four and five in private this morning? Yep, yep. Thank you. Item three is Scotland's Colleges 2018. And I'd like to welcome our witnesses today, Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Mark McPherson, Senior Manager, Audit Scotland, and Mark McCabe, Audit Manager of Audit Scotland. I'd like to um, invite the Auditor General to make a short opening statement. Thank you, Convener. This report provides an overview of the college sector in Scotland, in particular the state of college finances and the learning outcomes for students. The report identifies a slight improvement in the financial position of Scotland's 20 incorporated colleges in 2016-17. However, this does mask, mask significant variations between colleges, with several facing financial challenges. Colleges are forecasting that their expenditure will increase faster than their income between now and 2021, leading to a growing financial deficit across the sector. Staff costs are increasing, and the full impact of harmonising pay and conditions is estimated to cost an extra £50 million a year from 2019-20. Government funding decisions after 2019-20, along with cost of living increases, could add significantly to the financial pressures on colleges. The Scottish Funding Council commissioned a college estate condition survey in 2017. This estimated a backlog of repairs and maintenance of up to £360 million over the next five years. The Funding Council is providing £27 million of capital funding to colleges in 2018-19 to tackle the very high priority repairs. With the financial pressures on colleges, it's essential that they plan effectively. Colleges' financial forecasts don't currently provide a reliable picture of the future financial sustainability of the sector, and the Funding Council and colleges need to address this as a matter of priority. The sector continued to exceed its targets for learning activity and student places. A high proportion of college leavers continued to enter positive destinations like training, employ employment and higher education, and student satisfaction remained high. But in spite of colleges' efforts to tackle the barriers facing students from deprived areas, the gap in attainment between students from the least and most deprived areas is growing. Finally, this year's report looked at the operation of regional strategic bodies in the three multi-college regions. The regional strategic bodies have developed at different rates. There's been some progress since 2016, but the regional arrangements vary in how well they're meeting the wider aims of regionalisation. Alongside me, convener, are members of the audit team at Audit Scotland, and we're very happy to answer the committee's questions. Thank you very much, Auditor General. I'm going to invite Ian Gray to open questioning for the committee this morning. Um, thanks very much. And, uh, Auditor General, I um, think the committee will be pleased to see that this year's report on colleges is, um, shows an improvement in the financial position of the sector, because I think over recent years, that, that's been a concern with the annual report, uh, and that's good, and we should uh, acknowledge that. Um, but you did say there, or you sounded uh, some concern there about the financial position moving forward. So I just wanted to explore that a little further. Um, uh, the report would appear to indicate two, two problems there are two potential challenges there, one around capital, and I think some colleagues will pursue that in a bit more detail, but I wanted to concentrate on the, the revenue funding for colleges uh, just now. Uh, on, in paragraph 29 of the report, there are the SFC's uh, uh, recommended assumptions that colleges could use for longer-term planning. Um, one is about capital maintenance, but one is about teaching grant, that it will stay the same. Uh, one is about the cost of national bargaining, that uh, colleges should expect some support in the next couple of years, but that will reduce to, to zero. And the fourth one is that colleges should factor in a 1% increase for pay awards, and as the report points out, that 
is not a realistic assumption. So um, I really just wanted to get a sense from you of uh, how serious a problem the college sector faces um, on the basis of their current position and these assumptions going forward. I think it is serious, and that's one of the main messages of the report. Um, the first thing to say is that although we have seen a slight improvement in the overall financial position, um, it is a very slight improvement. It's a very small deficit, a very small surplus ac across the sector as a whole, and colleges are operating within very tight margins, so there's not much room for manoeuvre for them. Um, the three areas that you highlight there are all significant parts of their costs. Um, just very briefly on the capital costs, um, as we know, the overall um, backlog is about 360 million. This year, there's 27 million of funding for the very high priority um, repairs that are required. That's a big gap, and it's unlikely to be closed in the short term by similar levels of capital funding going in. And beyond that, as we know, staffing costs are by far the biggest element of the um, costs that colleges have to meet. Um, we don't know how the costs of harmonisation will be met after 2019 20. Um, and as you say, government pay policy has moved moved on from the very tight restraint we've seen over the last few years, and 1% feels like a, a very um, tight assumption to be using looking ahead. Those are the reasons why we think that the financial forecasts aren't um, as reliable as they need to be. Uh, even if colleges were using these assumptions, they'd be tight, and we know that some colleges have used their own assumptions because they think their circumstances are different, so we haven't got that clear picture of what it means in practice. What do you think would have to happen in order to provide a sounder foundation for the sector moving forward? I think there are two things. One is that the government is gradually moving towards um, providing a clearer picture of its medium-term financial outlook. We saw the publication of the medium-term financial strategy back in May. That contains a lot of information about likely tax revenues, less information about um, expenditure in different portfolio areas, particularly outside the priority areas of health and social care, for example. So more clarity about government spending plans would help. Within that, colleges um, refining their forecast so that they're not just based on assumptions but are really based on what they think their cost pressures are and then using those as a basis for planning on their own and with the funding council for what they are able to do to close any gaps that that shows up. Whether that means more funding or reducing costs will be part of that discussion. Okay. So the other side of this um, is the activity that colleges are expected to undertake um, and that's also been, I think, a theme of... Um, the recent run of, of annual reports into the sector um, and previous reports had shown uh, a very significant drop in the headcount number of students in the sector, I think from a, a peak of just under three, 380,000 back in 2007-8 and then there was a figure of 130, 140,000 fewer students. Previous reports you've presented to the Committee Auditor General general indicate that that was uh, largely a reduction in uh, students who were women part-time uh, and older students and that was because of a government requirement on the sector to focus on full-time uh, uh, young students uh, on courses leading to employability. Um, that, that, that's fair, isn't it, that that was the, the direction of travel. The report suggests that changed, is that right? That the yep. uh, Government policy, as you say, was to focus um, further education provision on uh, full-time students leading to recognised qualifications. And the impact of that was to reduce the number of part-time students, and particularly older and female part-time students, given the makeup of people um, taking courses at that point. Um, the, we reported that over a couple of years, the last two reports, and I think government policy has now shifted um, in the ways that you describe. In Exhibit 8, we show the trends over the last six years, and we're starting to see a slight increase again in the, the number of um, students by headcount. Um, the largest increase, I think, was part-time students, although interestingly it was part-time students under 16 as part of the developing the young workforce policy, um, rather than um, going back to the student population who were displaced previously. So, so just to be clear on that point, the, the increase in student numbers is not entirely but almost entirely made up of um, what most of us would consider as school students taking part in developing young workforce vocational opportunities in college. Is it also the case that 
around half that increase is actually in one in one college, in Fife College. Uh, the largest increase is certainly part-time learners, particularly under 16-year-olds. I'll ask Mark to talk you through the detail of that number. Well, on the latter point, yes, Fife made up half of that amount. Um, if you look at Exhibit 9 on page 22, you can see that there has been a small increase in the number of students aged 25 and over, so it's not solely down to the students under there. And uh, students over the age of 25 still make up about 42% of the student population, so it's still a large proportion of the population, mostly in part-time courses. I, I, I think the point I'm getting to is this, in planning sensibly for going forward, clearly the more the sector knows about the financial position they're going to be in, the better. But surely also it's important for them to have some sense of stability in what they are required to deliver. So is it fair to say that that also has changed quite frequently over recent years? It, it is true to say that policy has shifted um, from the shift away from um, part-time older students towards full-time students working towards a recognised uh, qualification. Um, I think we're very conscious that there's a lot happening on the Enterprise and Skills Review and the wider strategic board. Um, and what we will be looking to see over the next couple of years is the way in which the objectives for FE colleges through the Funding Council are lined up with um, what SDS at Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Qualifications Authority are doing and the wider planning for how all of these separate policy strands, developing the young workforce, the 15 to 24 learner journey and the wider economic strategy are joined up. At the moment it's hard to see how that joining up is happening. Um, it matters in any case, this, this is people's ability to work and prosper through their lives and it matters particularly at a time when Scotland's taking on the new financial powers and our economic performance will have a very direct impact on how much we've got to spend and invest on public services. So, so in order to plan for going forward, they could do with more clarity about where their finances will go, but also um, how policy uh, will, no, what policy objectives the, the, the government or we will be looking for them to deliver on. Yeah. And how they join up and with the other players up. under the strategic board. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mr. General, are there any good examples across the sector of where that joined up work is happening? Um, I'll ask Mark to give you a couple of, uh, to give you more detail in a moment. Um, it, it's worth saying that we think one of the things that UHI is doing well is getting that picture right across the Highlands and Islands of uh, what the needs are, what the colleges can deliver, and where the gaps are that need to be filled. But there are smaller scale examples as well. Mark. Uh, skills Development Scotland also has responsibility for taking forward the uh, skills investment plans and they bring together SFC, colleges, universities and other key stakeholders and areas to, to discuss around that. We haven't looked at those in detail but they, uh, they provide a platform for more localised uh, engagement across the, the key areas that are, that are linked towards enterprise and skills. Thank you. Alex Neil. Good morning Auditor General. Can I, first of all, just building on the theme from Ian Gray, talk about um, the financial progress of the sector uh, and two issues in particular which in previous evidence to this committee from various bodies have, have arisen uh, about the best use of the existing resources. Um, if I can take the example of Glasgow which has got this strategic board but there's only two colleges in Glasgow, basically a very big college and a s smaller college. Um, and it seems to me the consensus of the people I speak to in Glasgow is this middle-ranking board is a complete and utter waste of time and money. What would your comment be on that? Um, and would we not be better using that money uh, for expanding student bursaries in Glasgow, which is, are desperately needed, rather than wasting it on an unnecessary tier of management? I've reported um, to the committee before that I think the college reform programme um, developed in a way which left the regional bodies in a slightly odd position. Um, from a starting point where I think the, the policy intention was to encourage regionalisation right across Scotland, um, to an extent it became much more voluntary and as it now stands we only have three of the regional strategic boards, one in Glasgow as you say, one in Lanarkshire which also includes, includes two colleges and one in the Highlands and Islands where the 
University of the Highlands and Islands covers all of the colleges in the area. Now, they're quite different in terms of what they do, and as we say in the report, they've made different degrees of progress. Um, we say in this year's report um, that they are all now in a position where they're capable of delivering their core responsibilities, and that wasn't the case last year but it's not clear how they're contributing to the wider aims of regionalisation, which was about better outcomes for students and better links with the employers. Until we're starting to see evidence that they're delivering those things, I think it's difficult to say the policy of regionalisation has been a success. Mark wants, may want to say a little bit more to you about the specific arrangements in Glasgow and what we, what we know about them. The broadcasting oh, will... Sorry. Um, in, in terms of Glasgow, um, you, you point out, um, we, we see in the report that there are some mixed views around um, the establishment of the regional board. Um, we have started to see progress over the, the past few years, um, and you know we're, we're seeing a lot more um, collaboration between the individual colleges through the board, um, more coherent strategies, um, and starting to make some progress and traction. And what we've recommended in the report is that the, the regional board um, works with the individual colleges to overcome some of those concerns that people have in order to get more traction and, and make more progress going forward. Asko, where is the evidence there's been any added value from having this board? Apart from rather large salaries that get paid to themselves. Well, we have seen that um, there is greater coordination. So they have things like um, curriculum hubs where they're jointly planning college courses to match um, economic and employer needs. We're seeing um, the the board bringing together regional leads. Um, where the happen without the regional board there's no evidence that the regional board uh, you know without the regional board these things wouldn't happen anyway it it's a difficult one to to argue um you know colleges have always done some joint work together um but the, the, the board, board is there and the, the board is starting to make progress in um some of the areas that the you know the aims of regionalization um are geared towards Telling me the regional board in Glasgow provides value for money. Well, we haven't um, we haven't said whether it provides value for money or not. Um, you so know, we'll not was... be looking at because it, it spends a fair bit of money, which you know, if redirected to student bursaries, would have much, I think, and a lot of people think would have much more impact on improving college education in Glasgow than wasting it on this bit of bureaucracy that very few people think is adding any value. Neil, I think, is that until all of the regional boards move on to demonstrate that they are able to deliver the planned benefits of regionalisation, they're not in a position to demonstrate value for money. Um, but, I mean, how long have they been up and running, Auditor General? I mean, how long have they got? It, it was just a, another blank cheque. The establishment of them is a policy matter, and as you know, I can't comment on that. I have reported this year that it's the first time that all three of them are in a position to fulfil their statutory responsibilities, and that's slow progress from, from when they were first um, mooted in policy and over time recognised as able to fulfil their functions by the Funding Council. Um, they... Um, are there to deliver wider benefits that matter about outcomes for students and better links with employers. And until they can demonstrate that, I think it's not possible for us to say they are delivering value for money. But how long have they been up and running now? They vary. Um, the, the Act was the 2013 Act. Um, the, the, they were recognised by the Fundy Council as ready to take on their responsibilities at different points during the period since then. And I think Glasgow was only recognised within the last year or so. Um, so establishing them was slow um, and demonstrating the benefits that they were set up to provide is obviously even slower. That's one of the findings of my report. There's obviously an issue there maybe that we need to take up with the government about the need to demonstrate the value of these regional boards um, and, and to prove that they're necessary to, to achieving the, necessary, the, the strategic policy objectives in each area. I think it's also a question for the Funding Council, which has to recognise them as ready to take on their new responsibilities. Yeah. Okay, a, a related question. I mean, we had heard evidence about New College Lanarkshire, and I don't want to specifically talk about New College Lanarkshire this morning because we're having a further session specifically on that report. But one of the uh, themes emerging from that, and indeed from previous sessions with other colleges, are the layers of management and the allocation of resources within colleges where it seems to be very top-heavy on senior and middle management. And 
the resources getting spent on management that would be better spent on delivery at lecture level, lecturer level. Any comment on that? Um, I recognise it's a concern um, that you've raised a number of times in committee, Mr Neil. Um, and as you say, in New College of Lanarkshire, I think it will be a focus of the evidence session you have planned um, in the next few weeks. It's not something we've looked at directly um, in this report. We've looked at costs and performance. Um, one of the things we are interested in is the very variable performance of colleges across the country. And if you look at Exhibit 10, we've got a kind of heat map which looks at the performance um, on a red, amber, green rating across the four measures of performance um, for each college there. And it's a very variable picture from colleges like Orkney that are all greens um, to other colleges that have got much more red in there. And I think it's a perfectly valid question to be asking the funding council um, what they know, what they're doing about this uh, variability of performance and how that relates to what council, what colleges are spending on their management um, and the other ways they go about organising and um, delivering their responsibilities. That's at the heart of value for money. And at the moment, nobody, I think, knows enough about the reasons for the differences. And my final point is a wider uh, issue, and that is the 360 odd million for backlog. Um, now, obviously, this I know this is based on the Scottish Funding Council's own survey of property in the sector. But if you look at their surveys, there's a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, for example, how much of this is genuine backlog and how much of it is planned replacement, refurbishment, or, or uh, expansion uh, funding for new buildings? I mean, when I read the word backlog, uh, having been in business, I interpret backlog as being works that need done that so far have not been done. Uh, when I look at the projection and the breakdown of the years in which this money is liable, a fair chunk of it is after, uh, on and after year five, and a fair chunk of that is for new build, not for backlog. So should we not be trying to get this funding council to give us a much, much more accurate picture of what is genuine backlog? Um, you're right that it's important to be precise about the terms we're using. Um, I think the estate condition survey is a bit more precise than some of the, the um, wording that we've used perhaps and that has been used in the committee. Um, the uh, College Estates Con Condition Survey, I think, identified overall repairs and maintenance requirements um, of across the next five years of 360 million. So that's the total. Not all of that is backlog. Um, the backlog of repairs and maintenance is 163 million across the five years. Um, and they have then prioritised within that what's very high priority, so required in order to make sure that buildings are safe um, and can continue to be used for their purpose, through to the things which are nicer to have but not as essential. Given, given the publicity this got when this report was published, as you've just said, the real backlog's about 163 million, not 360 million, if you take the proper definition of backlog. So should we not be in, in presentation, both in terms of the Funding Council and the, the audit report, have two columns and not just one, one for what is genuine backlog and one for, you know, planned improvement, refurbishment, etc. Because, you know, one one is entirely separate from the other. When you're planning any kind of business, your backlog repairs, which are much more urgent sometimes uh, because of asbestos or whatever, uh, is a completely different uh, priority uh, and very often funded in a different way from new build, refurbishment, etc. So should we not split the two? I'm not sure that that is um, necessary for planning, which is what we're talking about. The 360 million is the estimate that comes from the Estates Condition Survey for both the backlog of repairs and maintenance and the investment that's needed to keep the estate fit for purpose as it's changing the sorts of um, qualifications. Doesn't say that. Your report, your report in the key facts diagram calls this estimated total cost of backlog of repairs and maintenance. It doesn't say, and also new build, etc. And, and therefore, it's very, very misleading. Uh, paragraph 25 breaks down the 360 no, but million. I know it breaks it down, but, but the headline and the press release that went out and the, the coverage in the media all created this hysteria around the backlog. And in fact, it was based on inaccurate figures because it wasn't backlog. It was backlog and plans for new build. The um, 360 million is the total investment that's required over the next five years for. And that's not what you see. You see, it's backlog. 
and, and for repairs and maintenance. So that's not accurate. And I'm sorry if that's the impression we've given. I think the important... It is. OK, I'm accepting that, Mr Neil. The important fact is that the £360 million investment is what's required to both deal with the backlog and keep the estate fit for providing qualifications yeah, across the piece. I think we just need to look at the presentation in we'll future. We'll have a look at that, certainly. Mark, I think, may want to add just a bit more clarification to what's in the figures. Is that why you're...? Yes. Um, you. So um, the £360 million does not include new build... Um, this was for maintenance of the, the existing estate. Um, the, the survey breaks the maintenance down into four particular categories, from very high to high, uh, main, uh, high priority, medium, and then low priority. So that there's, a, there's an indication of you know, what the profile of investment is required over the, the next sort of four or five years. Um, and what and I've got stuff for various colleges. One of them has a 10 million figure for a new tower that's going to be built in year five or beyond. And that's included in this figure. So that doesn't stand up to what you've just said. Okay. Um, my, my understanding was that it was for the repairs and maintenance to the existing estate. In council, in their terminology, you're, I think you're all at odds on this. I think you need to go back and look at it and present it more accurately and make the clear distinction between genuine backlog and planned new investment, because these are two different things. Oh, so General, is it possible <coughs> that your team could go away and review this and perhaps write to the committee with some clarification? All of the figures here, but I don't yeah. think it's a good use of the committee's time to go yeah. through them at that I, level I don't of detail. either, so perhaps yeah. we can wait for Certainly. you to communicate with us on Absolutely. much more detail and how this breaks down. Of course. Thank you very much. Can I um, refer you to the key facts page on the first page of your report? Um, you report that there's a 10.4% increase um, in Scottish government funding between 1617 and 1819. Now, it's my understanding that the colleges are spending the whole amount of this increase on the costs of harmonisation. Is that correct? Certainly, that's the largest part of the increase that's there. Mark, can you break down the, the figure for us? Sorry, can you repeat the... 0.4% is all being spent on the costs of harmonisation. Is that correct? Um, yes, the, um, so the, the additional cost of harmonisation is um, 50 million from 2019-20, and that's a recurring annual cost. Just for any members of the public watching, just say that harmonisation in the college sector is when regionalisation happened and we found that staff in different colleges were on different pay scales and different uh, pay rates, and so it was to bring all that into line. So the Scottish Government's funding increase for uh, colleges is all going on staff costs, is that correct? We say in the report that most of it is to meet the increased costs associated with um, bringing pain and conditions into uh, line with each other. Um, it's not quite all, but it counts for most of the 10.9% across the two years. It was 5% in 2016-17 uh, specifically to fund that. And Officer General, you said earlier in your answer to um, Ian Gray that the costs of harmonisation will no longer be met by the government after 2019. Is that correct? Uh, not quite. The, um, what we know is that the government has committed to meeting the costs for 17, 18 and 18, 19. We don't know what will happen after that. And it's one of the reasons why greater clarity for the colleges would help them to make their own financial forecasts more robust. So... We don't know where that money will come from. Can I ask you what the impact will be on the college sector when that 10% disappears? If that 10% disappears. If, if it um, does, yeah. If I can refer you to Exhibit 1, um, that breaks down the expenditure of colleges on the green uh, part of the exhibit of about £728 million. Um, the, by far the biggest part of that um, is staff costs, the dark green at £463 million. If the £50 million funding, which is um, currently available but not um, committed thereafter, isn't available, then colleges would have to find savings of that volume from within the overall £728 million that they spend, or alternatively find other sources of income, 
but as you can see on the left-hand side of that graph, beyond what they receive from the government through the funding council, there are other sources of income are, are relatively small compared. They come to a, a little bit less than 200 million in total, so to increase that by 50 million would be a real challenge. So at the moment, we have a Scottish government commitment only to meet this till 2019. Now, they may change their minds and find more money for the cost of harmonisation, but as it stands, there is no promise to fund it beyond 2019. But on top of that, colleges are being asked to make a 3% cut uh, every year. And for some colleges, that can total £1 million. So with that cut that they're being asked to make, coupled with the lack of money in the future beyond next year for harmonisation, what impact does that have? One of the overall messages of this report, Convener, is that although there has been this slight improvement in colleges' financial position, they remain under real financial pressure. There is the question of how they will fund harmonisation after 2019, that they will also have to find cost of living increases, um, and as we discussed in response to earlier questions, um, the uh, pressures on public sector pay are increasing for understandable reasons. We've got the pressures of meeting the um, required investment in the college estate, and we also have the potential impact of Britain's withdrawal from the European Union. All of those are really significant financial pressures um, on top of the efficiency targets which colleges, like most other public bodies, are required to meet. Auditor General, as, as you will know, some colleges paid for harmonisation themselves when they saw this coming down the line. Some colleges didn't and so are being, are, are being given the money by the Scottish Government. Now, for those colleges that paid it themselves, and I use Dundee and Angus College as an example, they paid for harmonisation themselves at a cost of £1.5 Do you think the government should refund them that money? Because in a way, they were organised and managed to uh, manage this themselves without the government having to step in. Should they be refunded for that? That's a question of policy which is beyond uh, my remit. Um, I think it's important to note, as the committee has um, investigated before, that different colleges were affected by harmonisation in different ways. Some of them started off with um, pay rates and other terms and conditions that were well below um, the national picture. Others were closer to it, and the cost implications for them are quite different. Um, that's why we think the Funding Council needs to be working with colleges to understand what the costs are really likely to be over the longer term on a consistent basis as a basis for a discussion about how those cost pressures can be met and the education that colleges deliver protected and enhanced. Thank you. Angela Constance, yeah, you have supplementary to that? Few, uh, various supplementaries. I'll trot through them as quick as I can, uh, convener. Supplementary on that point, and then I'm going to bring in Liam Kerr, and then All I'll right, come back just, to I'd, you. I'd try to come in, in various points to raise supplementaries. Okay, if you could do this point, and then I'll bring you back in later. Right, OK. Um, I do have uh, uh, three or four supplementaries. Um, have you um, assessed uh, the impact uh, of Brexit on the, the, the college sector at all? What are your um, views? We've had a look at the high level, um, at the level of um, EU funding which colleges uh, receive and at what they know about where staff and students come from and what the impact of Brexit might be. Um, it, it's a question, I think, um, that the Funding Council is looking at closely. Uh, we're planning to publish a position statement on EU withdrawal and what it means for public bodies a bit later in October, um, and I hope that will give a clearer picture. Again, I think it's something which affects different colleges in different ways. I'll bring Thank you. you. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'd like to come back to the assets issue. So, round about paragraph 25, as you were talking about earlier. Uh, very briefly, if I may, it, it, I, I, I understood the point that uh, Mr. Neil was making. If I can just ask a very brief question on that, because the, paragraph 25 seems to say the backlog of repairs and maintenance will cost about 360 million. Uh, and then again says repairs and maintenance. And in paragraph 24, uh, the report talks of 74.4 million of capital funding being given to colleges from the Scottish Government, but 42 million of that is for a new campus. Uh, so it, it, I just am finding it, perhaps like Mr Neil's, just slightly confusing. It's the, are new campuses included in the definition repairs and maintenance? The 360 million figure comes from the um, estates condition survey, 
which um, the Funding Council has commissioned to look right across Scotland's colleges at uh, what, what investment is needed in repairs and maintenance. Of that, they found that there's a backlog of £163 million, pounds, which um, is work that is currently outstanding. And they then looked ahead, and the other £200 million, not quite, um, is the repairs and maintenance that's expected to be required um, over the next five years as... Um, as, as it becomes due as buildings suffer wear and tear. Um, Mark, I think, can talk you through how that relates to what's in paragraph 24, which is, I think, at the heart of the question that Mr Neil asked before. Thank you. OK. Um, so in terms of the, the total capital investment, you're right, it, it's £74.5 million, pounds, and around £42 million of that is going to um, Forth Valley for their new campus. That leaves around about £32 million, um, Oh, no, sorry, that leaves around about £26, £27 million pounds of a difference in the capital funding. And that is the money that um, the SFC is allocating directly to colleges to cover what they have identified as being the, vi the, the, the very high priority repairs that were required within one year um, that were identified in the, the survey. So that survey identified that those costs were in the region of about £31 million. Um, when the SFC did validation of that, they found a couple of those were overstated and that figure came out at around about £27 million. So they fully funded the first year of very high priority repairs as well as the new build in Forth Valley, which, which brings that total to £74.5 million. I understand. On that very high priority, uh, what is very high priority? Uh, and when we say very high priority, are we talking about something that could compromise the safety of students and staff? Yes. So um, the definition in the survey is, giving, is given as um, is very high risk maintenance work that's required immediately or within one year to repair or replace elements of buildings that have already failed or at risk of imminent failure with a high risk of compounding damage cause, um, causing loss of service and or a health and safety risk. So that's the actual definition that the, the surveyors have used. So, yes. So, OK. And uh, following on, so, so that's uh, a pocket of maintenance, backlog of repairs that has to happen imminently. There's then a further 77 million uh, required to do high priority work, uh, which is not quite as serious as very high priority. Uh, but nevertheless, how serious are we talking in terms of high priority? And going back to the convener's questions earlier, where is 77 million supposed to come from in the next two years? Um, so that's something that the Scottish Funding Council will be looking at in terms of working with the government to determine um, how that level of um, investment is made going forward. Um, the, the Scottish Funding Council and the Scottish Government will obviously be monitoring the investment and what that results in. Um, to, to make sure that those figures um, keep up to date, but they'll need to look at what further capital investment is needed. So, it, at least in theory, £77 million could come from the SFC or Scottish Government, is what you suggested? Or are the colleges expected to find that? I think that's a, a debate that needs to be had um, between the SFC Government and colleges. Know where it's coming from yet. Um, respecting Mr. Neil's comment about the college in his area, as we understand it, the 360 million is not new build. It's all um, maintenance and repairs to the existing estate. Um, we know how much is available this year um, for repairs and maintenance and for new investment, and it falls a long way short of keeping up with that 360 million. That's why we report it as being a pressure on college finances. It, just out of interest, it, when something is defined as high priority, do you make a distinction or is there any uh, analysis done on how quickly, if and how quickly a high priority matter might turn into the very high priority which could compromise safety? I think that's part of the work that the surveyors who carried out the Estates Condition Survey have done. They've used their professional expertise to look at the condition now um, over the five-year period to um, look at what's urgent, very high priority to be addressed at this point, what requires doing over two years to, to avoid um, getting worse in that way, and then looking out over the remaining three years what investment is needed to keep the estate um, fit for purpose and to adapt it for um, changes to the types of teaching and learning that are carrying on. It doesn't include new build, it's about the existing estate. 
Now, in, in that respect, just finally from me, if I may, the, um, there'll be a lot of competing calls for funding by, by the various colleges to talk about uh, bringing their estates up to where they need to be. Uh, and uh, paragraph 27, you recommended that the, uh, the SFC produce some criteria so that they could decide where that, uh, that funding should go. Uh, I understand from your report that that has been produced as of December last year, but it hasn't been published. Uh, are you able to tell us why, if it will be, and whether you've seen it? Um, I don't think we know why it has been published. Mark, is there anything more you want to say about it? I don't think there's a lot more to say on that. Um, I don't know why it hasn't been published. Um, at, um, we haven't seen that, so um, I can't give you an answer, I'm afraid. Is anyone asking the question? It rather seems to me that uh, if I was a college, I would find it an awful lot easier to plan if I knew whether my work was likely to be priority or not. So is anyone asking the question of the SFC? Uh, you're absolutely right. It would help the colleges to plan. Um, I suspect the d the discussion going on behind the scenes is about how the capital funding that may be available can be best used to meet this very large investment um, requirement which has been identified. Mark, I think, is looking and, to come in. And, of course, in. on pages six of the report, we have recommended that the Scottish Government and the Funding Council should publish that criteria to allow that to happen. I hope they do. Thank you, Convener. Angela Constance. Thank you, uh, apologies for, for jumping around, but picking up on uh, some of Mr Neil's earlier questions, uh, I wondered if there was any evidence that regional bodies uh, were taking on some of the role and functions of the Scottish Funding Council or whether uh, there remains um, uh, duplication um, and whether or not there's uh, been any progress towards regional bodies uh, acting uh, in effect as mini uh, funding councils, uh, as was originally planned. I would say the closest we've seen to that is probably in University of Highlands and Islands, um, where the colleges in the region face very particular problems because of the remoteness, the rurality um, of the populations they serve. They're very small scale on the whole, which makes it harder to um, deliver the range of um, services and courses that are needed locally. Um, and the challenges of sustainability around recruiting staff and students. So I think the work that we've seen starting up in the University of, of Highlands and Islands of bringing the colleges together, helping them to understand how they complement each other, where they might be able to support each other, what support they can get from the university itself, and the ways in which funding might need to move to meet those different patterns of provision early days, but I think we're starting to see that happening. It's much harder to see evidence of that sort of um, role being carried out in either Glasgow or Lanarkshire, um, partly because they are really, as Mr Neil phrased it, sort of one large college and one small college. In Lanarkshire, the larger college is the regional board. In Glasgow, we've got the separate regional body, um, and we're not seeing that um, uh, focus on how they can really start to move beyond what the individual colleges do to meet the needs of students and employers better. And do you have a view that if regional boards were uh, stepping up and performing as uh, mini funding councils, um, how that process would be managed in terms of um, a reducing role for the uh, more centralised Scottish funding council? Um, I'm not sure that's a question for us at the moment. Um, as I say, the, the policy itself moved on between the initial review of further education and the legislation, um, and we've seen quite different models ac emerging across Scotland, with most of Scotland not having a regional body at all. Um, I think it would be helpful for the committee to review um, how far those policy aims have been delivered um, on the back of our finding that actually beyond the mergers and beyond the work that we're starting to see in UHI, there isn't much impact so far at all on those wider aims um, beyond simply having a body in place that can, fill it, can fulfil its statutory responsibilities. That's really all we're seeing at this point. Okay, and my final question for, for just now, uh, Convener, is that the Auditor General mentioned that there was variable performance uh, in terms of uh, outputs and achievements, and I wondered if that was related to um, 
variable uh, uh, financial uh, soundness. I mean, some colleges are more financially sound um, than others. So I wondered if there's a link between uh, financial stability and performance uh, or any evidence um, of that. And in terms of some colleges uh, being more uh, financially sound and making decisions to plan ahead, uh, as the convener uh, mentioned uh, also, I wonder if you could say a bit more about uh, what is uh, driving that. Is that you know purely uh, local factors, uh, or is it the uh, big national factors in terms of um, you know harmonisation, um, or you know are there uh, just exemplars of uh, good governance and financial planning out there? It's a really good question and one we tried to answer um, and found that as far as we can get was to say it's complicated. There isn't a clear link between the colleges that are doing particularly well or particularly poorly in Exhibit 10 and their financial health and financial sustainability. It, they fall into different categories. Um, many of the factors we know are local. Um, the extent to which the local communities they serve are more or less deprived. The state of the um, local economy and the number of uh, other other um, opportunities there are for learners um, and the uh, the extent to which there are flexible pathways for learners and students to work through that's why we think um, the funding council should be using exactly this sort of information about performance and about financial health to understand what's driving it and what lessons can be learned what are the things that colleges themselves can do and the regional bodies where they exist to be getting more performance at a at a better value for money, um, and how can they support the colleges that are struggling to do that? How strong is the evidence that colleges are meeting uh, the needs of their local economy? As we say, um, the uh, the impact that the evidence that the regional bodies are doing that is not yet there. Um, I think that it's one of the things that we'll want to look at when we pick up the strategic board enterprise and skills. Um, FE colleges are not the only part of that. They have to be working with SDS, with the SQA, with the enterprise bodies to do it. Um, and it's very much the role, I think, of the strategic board to be looking at the evidence, looking at the extent to which they're aligned, and then looking at what needs to change as a result of that. You would be looking at indicators uh, on the ground in uh, a particular uh, local economy, because I know, for example, that my local college would argue very strongly that they are meeting uh, local economic need uh, and they would you know, evidence that in terms of uh, you know, the student uh, demographics, you know, course provision, as well as their plans for the future. Um, yes, and it's something I would expect the Funding Council to be doing. They are um, distributing large amounts of funding to FE colleges each year. We think it's important that they have got a very clear sense, not just on the performance in relation to students directly, but on how well those students are able to meet the needs of local employers, as I say, particularly in a context where our economic performance will have a very direct impact on the amount of money we've got to spend on services, on infrastructure, on all of the things that are government priorities. Thank you, Camilla. Willie Coffey. Thank you very much. Convener uh, Caroline, I wonder if I could pick up again on the salary harmonisation issue that the convener also mentioned on behalf of the Dundee and Angus Colleges, and I'd like to raise it on behalf of Ayrshire College. Um, as you know, Ayrshire College also was one of the colleges who met the cost of uh, merger uh, harmonisation costs themselves at that particular point. Um, can you be clear that that, that is in fact a one-off award and that's somehow not consolidated uh, so that Ayrshire will not be effectively paying for that in the years to come. Can you clarify that every college will be back to the same base level and, it, and is that the figure, the £50 million pounds that you mentioned earlier for the whole college sector in terms of the whole harmonisation bill? That's the best estimate that's been produced by Colleges Scotland and accepted by the government and the SFC. Um, as we've said a number of times, it is complex because individual colleges started in different places, and I think the figure has become clearer and firmer over the two or three years that this has been negotiated. But 50 million is the best figure that's come through for all staff, for lecturing staff and for support staff in colleges um, from the 2018-19 year onwards. So it's the best figure there is. For all the colleges, for even, all colleges. even those who yeah. funded the harmonisation costs themselves? That, that's, that's the intention, and it's the figure that's been accepted by the, the Funding Council and government. So have you a figure of what the cost was to fund those that didn't fund the harmonisation costs themselves? No, that's, that's the overall picture across is Scotland. Mark is looking to come in there. Yeah. Yeah. 
I just wanted to clarify one point that colleges who uh, were formed as a result of merger of predecessor colleges, a number of those definitely did undertake harmonisation of those college pay terms and conditions at that point in time, and it's just one of them. But, but of course, what we're now talking about is national harmonisation. So if, if the, those colleges after merger and harmonisation were still below whatever the, the final nationally agreed figure would be, then they will have another element to pay as well. So so it doesn't necessarily mean if a harmonising of point of merger that that's all, all the cost, uh, if you like. There is local harmonisation as a result of merger, and then there is a national harmonisation. Right, when, when I wrote to John Kemp about this, he said to me, had Ayrshire not harmonised at merger, it would receive a higher level of funding now. That kind of suggests to me that somehow that's consolidated, that, that, that higher award would be consolidated and a new baseline established, or is that wrong, do you think? I, I think it's the same point the convener made, that some colleges, um, either because of mergers that were happening locally um, or uh, because of other factors, raised pay um, to a common basis at that point, and that put them in a position where the gap between that and the, the national um, harmonisation agreement was smaller than it otherwise would have been. They met some of that costing from their own resources. Had they not done that, they would have a bigger gap to meet now, um, and the funding would have been available to them to do it. The convener's question whether, was whether they should receive funding to compensate for that. Uh, that's not a that's a policy question and not one I can answer. But it is clear that the gap is now smaller than it would have been because of the action they took at the point of merger. My point is slightly different from the conveners. Is that we're all back to the same point that we were before the harmonisation awards were made by some of the colleges. We're all back at square one, base one level, aren't we? Yes, and the fifty million is based on getting from where we are now to um, the newly agreed terms and conditions. If I'm understanding you correctly. So I'm interested in if we can get a figure that was paid to those colleges that didn't do this, because that, that to me convener tells me that some colleges sat on their hands and just waited for the Scottish Government to step in and pay this money, and I don't think that's particularly fair. I'm not sure. all, back, all colleges are back at the same position as the Auditor General has explained. For Ayrshire, the, the gap now is smaller. So they, in theory, if every college was funded for the gap, then they would receive a smaller amount than they would have done had they not harmonised. So, you know, you could argue that they would be disadvantaged in that way. Um, I think we're not in a position to comment on whether the funding will be fully met in retrospect for any harmonisation that took place prior to the, the, the national harmonisation. And again, could, could we possibly get a figure from someone about the amount of money that was paid to those colleges who didn't harmonise at the point of merger? Because that was Scottish Government money that was paid to some colleges and not others. I, I, think, I think all that we've got is the other side of that, which was the costs of mergers, which we reported on in this report a couple of years ago, and we can certainly pull that out for the committee. In a sense, that's the other side. That's the additional money that went in when that first harmonisation happened, rather than the cost of not doing it um, for the other colleges, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay. Can, can Mr Coffey, it's a figure we could get from the Scottish Funding Council as well. Second point in this, as you, as you know, oh, Auditor General, and you've mentioned it in your report on page 15, Ayrshire College have an additional millstone around their neck, and it's the, the £2 million a year legacy PFI debt that they're having to pay. Uh, I believe they're unique uh, in Scotland now in having this additional burden uh, to pay, and, and I think it's due over the next seven years, and it's bringing even more financial pressures to the college than perhaps are being experienced by the rest of the college sector in Scotland. Do you know if any progress is being made in that regard to try and resolve this matter? Because it's particularly serious. You're right that they are unique. Other colleges that had PFI contracts have now had those contracts bought out. Um, and the other PPP deals are non-profit distributing models where the government pays the charge directly so it doesn't affect the college's budget. Um, I don't think we've got anything more to say than what we say here, but I'll just check with Mark. Now, we know that discussions have been ongoing between the Funding Council and the college for a number of years now around this issue because the college has obviously been aware of it since the point of merger, and we know that those, those discussions continue. Uh, the latest information is what was in the report, and we haven't heard anything further. Did you say, Carolyn, that some of the previous PFI contracts were bought out? Um, uh, uh, could you say when and who? And yeah, what, what? I mean, I think West Lothian College was one of the ones that had a PFI deal. Mark can tell you what the current position uh, is. I mean, my understanding, Mark might be able to correct me if I'm wrong, is that in, in any of these uh, PPP deals, the college, most of the college will have been expected to make some sort of contribution toward the cost of it, although uh, 
proportioned amounts will have been provided by government or the SFC. I think Ayrshire's uh, situation, as you say, is a bit different and is uh, unique in that sense. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Paid for the West Lothian College PFI. I think it will have been the funding council via Sc or Scottish government via the funding council. Could you tell me when that when that was? I don't have the details for West Lothian. We can find that. Okay. Perhaps if there's any further questions specifically on West Lothian College that um, Mr. Coffey, maybe Audit Scotland can write to you with further details on that. Do you have any further questions? Okay. <coughs> Auditor General, can I ask just to follow up to Mr Coffey's first question and the point I was raising earlier, just briefly. Is there not a point here that we've talked about in previous sessions about trying to incentivise public bodies for good governance and good behaviour, as it were? It seems to me really unfair in the examples that I've raised and Mr Coffey's raised that the two colleges who planned, had, you know, their, their boards were able to foresee this coming in line with government policy, paid for it, planned for it, that they're being penalised, they're getting less money. It, is there not an issue there about, you know, penalising good governance? Um, I don't think I'd frame it in quite those terms, although I understand why it looks that way um, from an individual college's perspective. I, the way I would um, frame this is much more about the overall management of the reform programme. Um, we know that there was an awful lot of discretion given to individual colleges and regions for whether they would merge or not. Um, the extent to which the funding council met, the costs of mergers varied, and the overall evaluation of the reform programme and the benefits that it generated um, was not robust, um, in my view, and we've reported that over a number of um, these annual reports. I think what you're describing is one of the consequences of the way in which the overall reform programme was managed, which left some colleges bearing more of the costs themselves than others. Not all of them those who um, got ahead in the way that you described. The way that funding for, for example, voluntary severance packages came through was quite different, and in some colleges, which the committee has examined in detail, not well handled management rest with? Is that the Scottish Funding Council or um, government? I think it's a combination of government and, and the Funding <coughs> Council. The committee has looked at this in some detail in the past. Um, the extent to which there was clarity about the objectives of the reform programme and the extent to which the individual um, changes for colleges and groups of colleges that were merging was overseen and challenged, I think was quite variable across the country. Okay, thank you. Bill Bowman, you're very patient. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, can, can I touch on comments you make in paragraphs 9 and 31 of your reports? And I think most of the questions this morning have involved um, financial information. And in para 9, um, uh, you're saying, I think, that the colleges had to um, restate or get help in calculating their financial position. And in para 31, you say that... Um, there, well, you state what I hope is the obvious, that financial forecasts have to be based on realistic and consistent assumptions. Now, taking these together, are we saying that the colleges are not competent in preparing financial information, or are there some renegade colleges that won't just do as they're bid to by the financial, uh, Funding Council? Um, I think paragraphs 9 and 31 are looking at slightly different things, and I'm going to ask Mark McCabe in a minute to come on on, the, on paragraph 9, the underlying financial position. Um, paragraph uh, 29 and 31, which is the underlying assumptions for the forecasts, um, I think this is the first time that the um, Funding Council has worked with colleges to develop forecasts looking ahead on a consistent basis. Now, that is an important step forward, and I welcome it. Um, and the experience they had was that the colleges didn't all agree that the assumptions the Funding Council had proposed were the right ones. We talked earlier, I think, in response to Mr Gray's question about the assumption on uh, future pay increases. Um, now, my view is that a 1% assumption there uh, is quite tight on the back of pay restraint um, going back a number of years now since 2010 um, and the inflationary pressures that we're seeing. I think the Funding Council and colleges are still negotiating around what's an appropriate figure to put in there which recognises the constraints on public funding but also isn't so tight that it can't possibly be um, uh, stuck to over time and it's that process that's going on. So I'm not terribly surprised by that, although I do think it's important that people get it right. So the Funding Council just asks them to do something and they can ignore it? 
I don't think that's what happened. I think there was a dialogue between individual colleges and the funding council which said actually for these reasons we think that our assumptions are different for pay assumptions or for um, capital maintenance requirements coming through. So, does that mean they don't need to be consistent? I think it would be very helpful if they were consistent and I also think they need to be realistic both for what the individual colleges are facing and for what funding council expects to be available for government funding. In a sense, the missing bit of the jigsaw is the government's medium-term outlook and more detail about the funding it expects to put in after 2019. So what is the right solution here that wouldn't have you commenting on it then? Um, I think it would be very helpful if there were a set of agreed common assumptions which uh, colleges were applying and which was in line with the signals from government about the funding they would put in in future years. So just finally, is there a governance issue here that they are not doing what they're asked to do? Uh, I, I don't think so. Um, I think there is room, as I said, for the Funding Council to be... Um, to be working with colleges in more detail to understand what's underlying their financial position and their performance across the piece so that they can make sure money's going to the right places. But I think that's more complex than just a governance um, issue. I think it's about the funding council's role overall and the extent to which um, local autonomy and local accountability are in balance. I Mark, suspect that we're not going to understand this. Mark, would you like to add anything to that? Or? I, I can add clarification on the point in paragraph 9 where you were asking about the underlying financial position. So we'd made recommendations in previous reports that um, this was something that would be added to accounts to give um, a more transparent picture of uh, college's financial position because previously in accounts the, 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 the financial position could be skewed by things like depreciation pension adjustments and the like. Um, so this strips out some of that and tries to give a more clear, comparable picture across the board. Um, now this was the first time that colleges were preparing this um, as an addition to their accounts. Um, and inevitably, when, you know, when you're introducing something new, there was um, some inter different interpretation of the, the SFC's guidance around that. So what that took was a bit of additional work by the SFC um, and by ourselves in looking at this, um, the, the Kent data to try and actually work out what the, the true position is. So there, what we're simply saying is that actually going forward, there's the scope to strengthen that guidance and to you know tighten up the definition so that going forward colleges have got a stronger position. Thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Kavita. Briefly, if I may, Auditor General, you've noted in your report that there is a, a gender imbalance on the boards of the colleges and that currently all but three uh, are falling short of the statutory gender representation objective. Uh, you recognise that that's not necessarily entirely in the college's control, or at least some of them, uh, where they've got elected members, and you also cite UHI as taking steps to address it. Uh, I'm curious to know, though, what, what is the timeline uh, within which the colleges need to change or comply with the objective, and what happens to the colleges if they don't or can't? I think that's very much a question for the Funding Council about the way they're taking this new um, policy requirement forward. Um, as you say, um, there, there is a balance between the appointments made and the election, particularly, particularly of staff representatives to boards, um, but colleges vary, I think, in the extent to which they've got a plan for doing it um, and the speed at which they're making progress. Mark, is there anything that you want to add to that? Sorry, I don't, I don't have a date. I can, we can confirm that from the Act, of course. But... If it, yeah. Angela Constance. Um, just to um, pick up the point that it's not policy, uh, it's in legislation. Uh, and if I recall correctly, obviously the clerks can go and uh, check it uh, factually that uh, things like ex officio and elected members uh, are not um, included. Uh, and when Parliament uh, passed the legislation, um, uh, was wasn't unanimous, but I mean it was passed, you know, with hefty um, support. Uh, there was a very clear um, expectation put uh, across uh, the public sector. Liam Kerr, do you want to follow that up? No. Okay. Um, can I move to um, just finally Exhibit Eleven? Um, Auditor General, I think it's about student satisfaction. Exhibit 10, sorry. <coughs> 
I was slightly confused. I think it was perhaps to do with the colour coding and all of that. And I wondered if you could send the committee the figures that all this was based on. I would find that very helpful. Sure. Specifically on satisfaction, convener, we've got in paragraph 44 the results of the satisfaction survey at a national level, um, and we have it broken down if you'd find that useful. Um, what we've tried to do in that exhibit is to summarise all four of the performance indicators to give a sense of how colleges are doing. Is it possible to send us the figures for all four of the indicators for all of the colleges? I mean, presumably yes. you must have them quite easily. Yes. That would be great, thank you. Do members have any other questions for Audit Scotland on this report? Okay. Can I thank you very much indeed for your time this morning and for your evidence. I now close the public session of this meeting.